Hello and welcome to another in our series of community talks brought to you by the Center for Asian Health Research and Education, CARE for short, at Stanford, as well as the Stanford Health Library. My name is Bryant Lin, and I'm very pleased to meet you, pleased to welcome you today uh, to our fantastic talk on hepatitis B in Asian Americans, what you can do to lower your risk. I'm very, very happy to welcome my colleague and great friend, Dr. Samuel So. Samuel So is really an inspiration for us all, and he is a, one of the inspirations for us starting the Center for Asian Health. Uh, he's really standing on his broad shoulders uh, when we started our center uh, based on his excellent work. Dr. Samuel So is the Louis Hock Min Professor uh, and Professor of Surgery at Stanford. He's also the founder of, multidis of the Multidisciplinary Liver Cancer Program at the Stanford Cancer Center and the founder and executive director of the Asian Liver Center at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Dr. So is a native of Hong Kong and received his surgical training at the University of Hong Kong and the University of Minnesota, where he also completed his fellowship in multi-organ transplantation. His current clinical area of specialty is a multidisciplinary approach to the treatment of primary liver cancer and the management of chron chronic hepatitis B infection. He is listed among the best doctors in America. Dr. So is recognized worldwide for his expertise in chronic hepatitis B and primary liver prevention, research, treatment, and health policy. So I really uh, am really very pleased to welcome Dr. So to our Community Health Talks brought to you by the Vincent VC Wu Foundation. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and we'll answer them after the talk. Please join me in welcoming Dr. So. Thank you, Brian. Let me just share screen. Uh, first of all, I'd like to wish everybody a happy Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month and, and welcome all of you who, uh, who are attending this uh, talk tonight instead of watching the Warriors and LA Lickers game. So um, I'm going to talk about a, uh, a problem, a liver disease, which is very common in Asian. Uh, and I think many of us probably know of friends or family members who have been affected by this uh, problem. The disease I'm talking about is hepatitis B in Asians and Asian Americans. So what, what I would like to talk to you about is how you can, what you can do to lower your risks if you have hepatitis B or if you are not aware whether you are infected by this uh, infection. Hepatitis B is actually, you know, a major public health problem in the world. It is less well known than HIV, but it's actually a, a impact more people in the world than HIV. The World Health Organization estimated before the hepatitis B vaccine was recommended for all newborns, one in three persons in the world would become infected with hepatitis B uh, virus. Uh, an estimated 300 million people were living with chronic hepatitis B and about 800,000 people died largely from cirrhosis and liver cancer caused by hepatitis B in 2019. Although the hepatitis B virus could infect anybody, over 50% of those living with chronic hepatitis B are people in Asia and about 25% are people living in Africa. So if you go to most countries in East Asia, like you know, Taiwan, from, uh, you know, uh, Vietnam or China, it, you, an estimated one in eight to one in 12 adults living in those countries have chronic hepatitis B infection. Um, the, the prevalence of chronic hepatitis B in India is a little less, is about one in 30. In the US, uh, the CDC estimate that one in 12 foreign born Asian and Pacific Islander Americans are living with chronic hepatitis B, uh, compared with one in 70 U.S. born Asian and Pacific Islander, and compare with almost one in 1,000 
Hispanic, and white American. Uh, if you combine the foreign-born uh, uh, Black American and U.S.-born Black American, the prevalence is at one in 200. But, but mainly is because foreign-born Black American uh, has as high a prevalence of hepatitis B as Asian Americans. Although Asian Americans make up only 6% of the US population, they account for over 60% of the estimated one and a half to two and a half million people living with chronic hepatitis B uh, in the United States. So hepatitis B is recognized by the Office of Minority Health as a major health dis disparity between Asian Americans and uh, white Americans. In a study, we estimated um, that in California, because of our large Asian population, about 89% of people living with chronic hepatitis B in California um, are Asian Americans. And this chart show, you know, it's even higher in, in San Francisco and in the Bay Area over 90% of those living with chronic hepatitis B uh, in this Bay Area are likely uh, Asian and Pacific Islanders. And because chronic hepatitis B is a major cause of liver cancer, it's not surprising that um, liver cancer, which is not as common in Black and Hispanic or white American, is the second leading cause of cancer death in Asian and Pacific Islander men. And because of our large pop Asian population in the Bay Area, San Francisco and Santa Clara counties are among the counties with the highest incidence of liver cancer in the country. So, so what is hepatitis B? Hepatitis B is caused by a virus called the hepatitis B virus is among the smallest virus uh, in, in the world. It is actually not a new virus like the COVID virus or hepatitis C or HIV. It's estimated uh, to be between 8,000 to 20,000 years old and has been identified in mummified uh, children in both countries like South Korea, as well as uh, Italy. Hepatitis B is a major cause of death from liver cancer and liver cirrhosis worldwide. Uh, every year it takes uh, the lives of 800,000 to almost a million people. It's seven times more common and 100 times more infectious than HIV. And we call hepatitis B a silent killer because most of the people living with chronic hepatitis B have no symptoms until they develop late stage liver cancer or liver cirrhosis. So how do people get infected with hepatitis B? Hepatitis B is uh, transmitted in three ways. I always tell my students it's not BS, it's BBS. It's transmitted at birth from an infected mother to the newborn. And this is a major uh, way uh, Asians become infected uh, with uh, hepatitis B. It's also transmitted by infected blood through um, re people reusing needles and syringes um, and from injection drug use, and also could be transmitted by unprotected sex. There are a lot of misunderstandings about uh, how hepatitis B could be transmitted, especially in countries in Asia, and that has led to a lot of discrimination and uh, stigma associated with people uh, living with chronic hepatitis B. So um, hepatitis B is not transmitted by mosquitoes. 
is not transmitted by saliva or kissing or shaking hands, is not uh, transmitted by sharing cups or eating utensils or by food or water, and not transmitted uh, through casual contact in the workspace. And hepatitis B is not a hereditary disease. It is an infection that is transmitted, as I said, uh, through uh, mother-to-child transmission, uh, through infected blood, and through unprotected sex. So, so I, at this point, I'd like to um, sort of tell you about the types of viral hepatitis. They are basically five types of hepatitis. Just think of them as the digits in your, in your hand, okay? Hepatitis A and B, you know, like represented by your thumb and little finger, are transmitted by contaminated food and water, okay? So a lot of people uh, confuse that um, mode of transmission with hepatitis B, okay? The one transmitted by contaminated food and water is hepatitis A and E. Uh, if you get infected with hepatitis A and E, it could make you sick, and some people can actually die from it. But you know, if you, uh, uh, but most people will recover, and it does not cause a chronic infection. It does not cause liver cirrhosis or liver cancer. The hepatitis A vaccine uh, could be prevented uh, with a, a vaccine. It's a two-shot uh, vaccine you, you receive over six months, and potentially it could protect you for life. So, so all the children growing up in California, um, most likely they all have been uh, um, sort of vaccinated against hepatitis A when they were children. Um, hepatitis E, um, that is not very common. It only occurs in certain parts of the world like, and only occurs as an outbreak. And there's no FDA approved vaccine uh, or, and it's not um, sort of recommended to get the vaccine, which is uh, the only vaccine which is available is approved in China. And even in China, they don't recommend routine vaccination for hepatitis E. So it's actually reserved for outbreaks when it happened in certain parts of uh, the world. So what about hepatitis uh, B, C, and D? So hepatitis B, C, and D could all be transmitted uh, from mother to child at birth, from infected blood, and unprotected sex. But if you are protected against hepatitis B, you will not get hepatitis D. So, so if you are vaccinated against hepatitis B, you don't get hepatitis D because hepatitis D can only exist in a person who has hepatitis B. So, so don't worry about hepatitis D, uh, B, D at this time because if you are uh, protected against hepatitis B, you won't get B. So the danger of hepatitis uh, B and C is they both can cause liver cancer and liver cirrhosis. Um, and uh, hepatitis B, as I said, um, is very, could be transmitted to mother to child at birth. Hepatitis C can also uh, do that, although it's less common than hepatitis B. Uh, and both of them can cause liver cancer and liver cirrhosis. But, the, but with hepatitis B, we have a vaccine so we can protect you from hepatitis, uh, from being infected. Uh, currently, there's still no vaccine available uh, to protect you from hepatitis C. In this country, the major uh, way people get infected with hepatitis C is uh, because people are injected 
injecting dr uh, drugs. Uh, so um, in the old days, um, when people don't know that the, there was a hepatitis uh, C uh, and the blood uh, for transfusion was not tested for hepatitis C, so people who got who had surgery um, over 30 years ago uh, could have become infected with hepatitis C if they received blood transfusions. So what are the symptoms of hepatitis B infection? Um, the symptoms really depend on the age when you become infected. So infected newborns and infants usually have no symptoms, but they are at the highest risk of losing the battle and develop a chronic infection. So 20, as many as 20 to 90% of newborns uh, who become infected uh, from uh, mother to child transmission or unsafe injections uh, when they were uh, little, uh, they could develop this chronic infection, which put them later in life at risk. Um, usually, you know, very often, you know, 30 to 40 years later at risk of dying from liver cirrhosis or liver cancer. <clears throat> if, if the person become infected as, as an adult, uh, a, about a third of them will become sick with symptoms of fatigue, loss of appetite, or jaundice, which, which means yellow discoloration of your eyes and skin. And one in 200 may actually die from liver failure after they become infected. But most adults will eventually recover, although 5% to 10% can develop a chronic hepatitis B infection. So the risk of developing a chronic infection when infected as an adult is much lower than if newborns and infants become uh, infected. And that's why the importance of a universal newborn vaccination. Now, if, if you uh, become infected with chronic hepatitis B, uh, what are the symptoms? You know, actually most people living with chronic, hep chronic hepatitis B have no symptoms until, until they develop advanced liver cancer or advanced cirrhosis. And even the blood tests for liver function at routine physical checkup can be normal. Um, we call chronic hepatitis B a silent killer uh, for that reason, because a lot of people don't know uh, they have been infected. Um, if you have chronic hepatitis B, it increases the risk of liver cancer by 50 to 100 times. And um, if left undiagnosed and not monitored for treatment, as many as one in four will die of liver cancer or liver disease. That, that is why, um, you know, um, in countries like uh, China, where as many as 80 to 90 million people have chronic hepatitis uh, B, every year, over 350,000 people die of liver cancer, largely from uh, untreated uh, or undiagnosed uh, hepatitis B infection. So how can you tell whether you have chronic hepatitis B uh, when, when you go and get your checkup, uh, even your liver uh, function could be normal? The, the only way to know whether you have chronic hepatitis B is uh, get tested, uh, just like this uh, billboard. Uh, when we launched the San Francisco Hep B3 campaign about 12 years ago, and you can see on, on this uh, billboard, uh, Gavin Newsom, who is now our uh, governor in California, and Fiona Ma, who is now our uh, state treasurer, were uh, big sort of, uh, supporters uh, of the campaign. 
to, to try to eliminate hepatitis B at that time uh, from San Francisco. This, this US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that a third of the one and a half to two and a half million people living with chronic hepatitis B in this country are not aware they are infected. So uh, really every adult uh, should get tested for hepatitis uh, B. Uh, the test uh, for chronic hepatitis B is very simple. Um, it's often a three test panel, uh, it, which tests for hepatitis B surface antigen. And this, if this test is positive, that means that person has chronic hepatitis B infection. The other test is uh, called the hepatitis B core antibody test. And this test is um, useful in the sense it can diagnose whether someone has ever been infected. So if the hepatitis B core antibody test is positive, that means uh, that person in the past or have been infected with hepatitis B or currently is infected with hepatitis B. And the third test is hepatitis B surface antibody test, which uh, check you for whether you have immunity to hepatitis B, either because you were previously vaccinated or either because you previously got infected, but then recovered from your infection, okay? So uh, as of last month, the US CDC, Centers for Disease uh, Control and Prevention recommends all adults living in the U US uh, get tested for hepatitis B. Because as I said earlier, about one third of the people living with chronic hepatitis B are not aware they are infected. Well, in California, uh, due to our advocacy uh, and beginning in 2022, all outpatient primary care clinics are required by law to offer their adult patients a hepatitis B screening test. And so, and, you know, actually in California, uh, screening, hepatitis B screening is covered by all health plans, including Medi-Cal. And with the, if your doc doctor entered the appropriate screening codes, it's also covered by Medicare. So, so if you um, got tested, you know, how, how can you protect yourself from hepatitis B if you are not uh, infected? So if your blood, your hepatitis B blood tests show you have never been infected with hepatitis B and that you are not currently infected, you should protect yourself by receiving the hepatitis B vaccine. The World Health Organization called the hepatitis B vaccine the first anti-cancer vaccine because it protect you from uh, getting infected with hepatitis B, which can cause uh, a liver cancer. <clears throat> For adults, uh, if you want to get vaccinated, you have a choice of three types of hepatitis B vaccine. Um, you can get the traditional uh, three shot hepatitis B vaccine, vaccine given over six months. Uh, you can also get the more uh, uh, recently approved two shot hepatitis B vaccine. Uh, that you take uh, over one month, or you can take a three-shot combined hepatitis A and hepatitis B vaccine. Now, once you have received these uh, uh, full doses of the vaccine, currently the CDC have no recommendations for routine booster shots. Okay, so you... Once you got vaccinated, you don't have to worry about getting booster shots. Now note that 
uh, the vaccine would not provide any additional benefits if your blood tests show you have hepatitis B or in the past was infected with hepatitis B. The, the good news now, hepatitis B vaccine for children and all adults are recommended by the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices and are, and are now covered by health plans, including Medicare Part D, with no out-of-pocket uh, costs. So I'm sure when you, next time you see your primary care doctor, um, they will often now offer you uh, to get your hepatitis B vaccine, in addition to asking you whether you have complete your, completed your COVID uh, vaccines. So if you test positive uh, for chronic hepatitis B, well, what can you do to reduce uh, your risks? Well, uh, I would uh, suggest you consult your doctor or a specialist to see whether you should be uh, taking antiviral medications, even if you have no symptoms. As I said, most people with chronic hepatitis B have no symptoms. <clears throat> now, currently, anti Viral medication is recommended for patients with active liver inflammation uh, that can be detected by just your blood tests for a, uh, the level of uh, ALT, or if for people who have liver cirrhosis. Um, they, nowadays, there's no need for doing a liver biopsy to see whether you need to be on treatment or not. Uh, basic, based on your blood test results, and uh, if you have an ultrasound or abdominal imaging studies, it basically can tell whether you need to be on treatment or not. And the treatment is really simple. It's, it's a pill a day, and there are two first-line antiviral medicine. One is called entacavir, and the other one is called tenovavir. Uh, both are now very relatively inexpensive uh, because they are now uh, all can be uh, sort of a supply as generic drugs. Uh, and uh, once you start treatment, it, you need to be on long-term uh, therapy to suppress the virus. So just think of it, if you need to be on treatment, it's like getting treatment for high blood pressure. You, you take, and you know, for hepatitis B is even simpler. It's just a pill a day, uh, but it keep uh, it will suppress the virus, prevent further liver damage, and as a result, uh, you know, uh, prevent or reduce the risk of developing liver cancer. The treatment um, uh, is very safe and effective. Um, it can even reverse people who have liver scarring and fibrosis and cirrhosis and can prevent and reduce the risk of death from liver cancer and liver disease. Um, so, you know, if, if you need to be, uh, be on treatment, um, th there's no reason to delay uh, getting treatment. And you know, just, I just want to alert the, pub, uh, the public that, uh, you know, to not fall victim to false advertising of curative therapy, because to date there's no cure for hepatitis B. But uh, as I said, just like high blood pressure uh, uh, treatment, they are very effective treatment uh, to suppress the virus so you won't die from uh, hepatitis B related liver cancer or liver disease. <clears throat> As a result of passage of the new law in California, beginning in 2022, healthcare providers are required by law to offer their patients or refer the patients with a positive chronic hepatitis B screening test for follow-up care and treatment. So it's important to, to know that whether you are um, suitable for treatment or not at, at once at this time, 
is important anyone with chronic hepatitis B uh, be monitored uh, for flare-up of the hepatitis and for disease progression and for liver cancer. So, so sometimes uh, patients with chronic hepatitis B, when they first see their doctor, they would not have any evidence of active liver damage. But over time, with monitor, monitoring, uh, then some of them would develop active liver damage. And at that time, uh, treatment would be needed. Um, so, so just because, you know, most of the time, your test results are, are normal, it doesn't mean that you should not continue to be monitored because later uh, in time, many patients will develop uh, sort of uh, evidence of liver damage that require treatment. So monitoring is, is actually very simple. Uh, all it takes is uh, get a blood test or what we call ALT level to monitor for liver damage, um, a level of alpha fetoprotein to monitor for development of liver cancer. And every six to 12 months also get a blood test for hepatitis B DNA level to monitor for uh, how active your hepatitis B virus is. So, so basically, is in, you know, like most of my patients, that you only get a blood test every six months um, to make sure everything uh, remains stable and to see whether uh, if, you are, if you are not on treatment, whether you need to be placed on treatment if the, the uh, hepatitis virus uh, uh, flare up. And, and especially for those with a family history of liver cancer, and liver, or they already have liver cirrhosis, um, that put them at much higher risk of developing liver cancer. For those patients, they should get an ultrasound of the liver to monitor for any development of a liver lesion in the liver um, that could represent an early liver cancer. So the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease also recommend any uh, Asian men or, or black men over the age of, uh, starting from the age of 40 years of age should get uh, a liver cancer uh, screening every six months with a liver ultrasound. And for Asian women um, over the age of 50, they should also get uh, regular monitoring for liver cancer because they are at high risk of developing liver cancer. <clears throat> so what else should you do if you have chronic hepatitis B? <clears throat> we recommend you avoid or abstain from regular alcohol consumption, especially in patients who already have uh, liver scarring or liver cirrhosis because alcohol could uh, further damage your liver. Um, if you are not, if you have not been vaccinated against hepatitis A, you should receive the hepatitis A vaccine to prevent another virus from, uh, from uh, damaging your liver. So I always recommend uh, patients to get vaccinated against hepat hepatitis A because we, most of us now travel around the world and, uh, and you, you could actually get infected with hepatitis A when you uh, eat in some of these countries where the hygiene, you know, uh, in, uh, in the restaurant may not be that great. Um, also make sure your doctor know about your hepatitis B status and re, uh, remind them to place you on antiviral therapy before starting cancer or immunosuppressive treatments uh, that can potentially cause reactivation of the hepatitis B virus and, and potential risk of uh, liver failure. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a Stanford uh, Cancer Center, um, since 10 years ago, 
um, they have recommended sort of accepted our recommendation. Any any patient uh, uh, you know considered for chemotherapy, they should all be screened for hepatitis B to make sure uh, their patients do not uh, develop liver failure uh, from uh, reactivation of hepatitis virus. Um, it's also important to know your rights. In, the, you, in this country, the law forbids discriminatory employment and admission practices based on a person's hepatitis B status. The, the reason I want to bring that up is several years ago, a medical school on the East Coast uh, rescinded uh, the, the admission of a um, student uh, to medical school because he tested positive for hepatitis B. So as a result, uh, the school was sued by the Justice Department. And uh, since that time, it's is well known that um, you cannot sort of, uh, discriminate against someone because they have hepatitis B. Um, the only place which still have uh, may have a problem is the military. Um, I hear there are still instances that um, service members who were found to have hepatitis B uh, were discharged uh, because of their hepatitis B status. So hopefully that will change uh, very soon. If you have hepatitis B, uh, it, it's important to uh, make sure every family member are tested uh, and if they are not protected, get vaccinated because as I uh, indicated, a common, uh, the most common way Asians become infected is from a mother who, who's a hepatitis B carrier, which means actually people who have chronic hepatitis B, uh, who transmitted the infection to the newborn in the days, especially when there was no vaccine available. So if you are over 30 years of age, there's a really good chance you were not vaccinated because it was not actually uh, widely available uh, uh, to, to vaccinate newborns at that time. So, so most of the, uh, the people nowadays who have chronic hepatitis B are over the age of 25 or 30 because they were not vaccinated uh, because there was no vaccine available at that time. Um, and if one family member, um, you know, uh, became infected, uh, there's a, a good chance some of the siblings also could have be, become infected. So I, I know of some of my patients where, you know, a mound like, you know, six or seven siblings, and, you know, five or six of them, or also all of them also tested positive for chronic hepatitis B infection. It, so it's, it's really important to protect the next generation from hepatitis B and liver cancer. Uh, you can do that by making sure uh, newborns re receive the first dose of the hepatitis B vaccine within 12 hours after birth. We call that the birth dose and complete the vaccine series on schedule. Uh, and make sure babies born to mothers who are hepatitis B carriers who have chronic hepatitis B also receive, uh, in addition to the vaccine, the hepatitis B immune globulin within 12 hours after birth to further protect them uh, to, from becoming infected. And, and make sure pregnant women who are hepatitis B carrier uh, during pre pregnancy receive blood tests to monitor for hepatitis reactivation. So you want to protect the, the pregnant women themselves from the hepatitis B infection. And for women who, who, who are pregnant women with high viral load, it's recommended that they also receive uh, antiviral 
uh, therapy in the last uh, three months of pregnancy to further eliminate the risk of the newborn becoming um, infected. So I, I like to um, uh, tell you something about the Asian Liver Center at Stanford University. Um, <clears throat> I found that the Asian Liver Center in 1996, thanks to a generous a donation by Dr. C.J. Wong um, uh, at his uh, 80th birthday. Um, the, the reason I founded the Asian Liver Center is to address the disproportionately high prevalence of chronic hepatitis B and liver cancer in Asians and Asian Americans at a time when no one seemed to be doing anything about it. Um, as a liver transplant surgeon, you know, coming to California, um, it just bothered me a lot that no one was doing anything about raising awareness about this issue and getting people uh, tested, uh, vaccinated, and, and treated. Um, so uh, what we are, the, the goal of our uh, the center is to address the gaps in hepatitis B and liver cancer awareness research and national policies with the goal of global elimination of hepatitis B and reduce the burden of liver cancer uh, worldwide. To raise uh, public awareness about hepatitis B, we borrow a page from uh, HIV and use the color green or jade um, with a ribbon folded like a Chinese or Han character, meaning people, uh, to unite people worldwide to end hepatitis B and uh, liver cancer. Uh, we are very grateful to our donors, which uh, allow us uh, to have a great um, uh, office and center on campus at Stanford U University at the CJ Wong uh, building. Um, and Dr. Wong was very generous in, in uh, donating a building to Stanford to uh, let us have a home for the Asian Liver Center on campus. We are also very grateful to our donors to support uh, our center in uh, Beijing, which was uh, established 10 years ago at the Stanford Center at Peking University. So, you know, when I first founded the Asian Liver Center, people thought I, you know, I was very crazy that uh, how could you eliminate a disease which affects so many people uh, worldwide? But it is really feasible uh, to eliminate uh, chronic hepatitis B as a major public health problem uh, because we have a very effective vaccine and it's really inexpensive in, in most parts of the world uh, that can end the transmission of this virus and prevent people from getting infected. So if every if tomorrow everybody in the world get uh, vaccinated against hepatitis B, um, you, uh, you will end uh, the the sort of uh, end the transmission of this virus um, and prevent people from developing chronic infection, which can lead to liver cancer and liver cirrhosis. And nowadays with uh, a very effective um, uh, antiviral treatments, even though it's not a cure, but it's very effective, as long as you take the uh, medicine uh, regularly, long-term, uh, you can actually prevent virtually most of the deaths uh, and illness from cirrhosis and liver cancer. And you can end disease stigma and discrimination by you know, increasing awareness about how the virus is transmitted and, and by educating the public, which, which we, we, are, we have a very 
active program in China uh, to, to do that. So as I said, uh, 15 years ago in China, when I was interviewed by the uh, China Newsweek, eliminating hepatitis B in China is not a dream, but it really, at that time, I encouraged, I encouraged the Chinese government to uh, put more resources and investment in prevention of uh, hepatitis B by, um, you know, uh, making sure every child and infant are vaccinated against hepatitis B. So the CDC named viral hepatitis actually as one of the six winnable battles in public health in the US. So it's time to screen, it's time to treat, it's time to eliminate hepatitis B. So, I'd like to end by uh, showing to you uh, the slide that if you want to learn more about hepatitis B and how also you can help to support our work at the Asian Liver Center, please visit our website at liver.stanford.edu uh, and at happymoms.org. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, uh, be, being with us today, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. So, for such a wonderful, informative talk, and for, thank you for so much for your service to the community. We have many, many good questions for you. I'll start with the first one from uh, Sheila Wong, who's one of our fantastic uh, care supporters and co-chair of our advisory board. She asks, what's the likelihood or, or probability of developing chronic hepatitis B if you get exposed, as, as in particular in Asian. So if you have an exposure, what's your likelihood of developing chronic hep B if you're an Asian? So, so I, as I uh, indicated, it really depends on how old were you when you were exposed, right? So if you were exposed, um, I mean, or, or came into contact with the, the virus uh, as an adult, okay, you know, one, one, one out of three will get sick. But, um, and, and you know, as I said, one out of 200 could actually die after getting infected. But most will recover and only maybe 5% or 6% will develop the chronic infection, which can later on lead to liver cancer or liver disease. So, but it's a very different uh, problem in infants and children. Um, because they are very prone to develop a chronic infection, okay, and and that puts puts them at risk, um, you know, when they become adults to develop liver cancer or liver cirrhosis. So the globals of a uh, um, of uh, um, bird initiative in preventing hepatitis B is universal newborn vaccination. So that's the pillar of the global sort of uh, response. Fantastic, yeah, just underline, underscores the importance of having all babies vaccinated uh, right after birth. Uh, next question, uh, it's a great question. Why is uh, hepatitis B cure harder than hepatitis C? That we've all heard about is, and you've touched on, uh, we have these cures for hepatitis C. Why is, uh, why is it taking longer for the hepatitis B cure and a, and a caveat to that is uh, another question was, you know, how, how much, how long, how long will it be till we get a cure? Okay, so um, hepatitis B is a, um, sort of a DNA, DNA virus and it's a very smart virus, okay. It, it's so smart that it, it used your, your liver to make baby virus and it, it usually doesn't kill you right away. It, it just likes to live in your liver and keep on making baby virus, right? And, and it has a way to do that because uh, it can actually, uh, you know, um, survive in the nucleus of your liver cells in the way that the drugs cannot get to it, okay? So it's very difficult uh, to really get rid of that uh, Part of the virus in the nucleus of the cell, which is not uh, rapid, which is not active, 
is not uh, replicating, right? So, um, you know, five years ago, people would say, oh, five years uh, from now, we will have a cure. But that was five years ago. Now we say, oh, maybe another five years. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I wouldn't put your, my bet on it. And even the, you know, a number of uh, startup companies or even uh, established pharmaceutical companies are trying to tackle this problem. And, and they are very honest. They are only trying to produce drugs which can actually, uh, uh, it's not still, it's what we call functional cure. It's not a total cure. It just makes, makes you lose that hepatitis B surface antigen, you know, if, you're take, if you take the drug for six months, you know, and they are, they're shooting for a target of uh, maybe um, achieving that in 30% of people who take the drug. So it, it, it's, we are far away from finding a cure. Far, far, far away from finding a cure and hard to predict the future, right? But, but to, to me, it's, it's you know, I, I think it's naive to, to just wait for a cure when there are such effective drugs uh, for treatment, so you don't die from it. <laughs> you know? Right, 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 right. right. <laughs> Got to focus on what's important. Um, next question. Uh, I'm going to add to this next question. Uh, this this uh, one of the attendees is asking if you have uh, if you were infected, you have a core antibody positive, but now you're immune. Are you? Do you need to do anything different than somebody who you know was never uh, exposed? And then a corollary to that is: What if you have a core antibody positive and you're you're not immune? Your core your surface antibody is negative. What do you have to do then? So one scenario is you've got a surface antibody and core antibody, so you're exposed and you're immune. Uh, do you need to do anything different than somebody who's not infected? And then you've got somebody else who's got a core antibody, but surface antigen negative and surface antibody negative. What do you do in those two cases? So, so for, for the person who is core antibody positive and, and also um, surface antibody positive, that means that person got infected and then developed immunity, right? So, so, uh, so that person probably have very low chance of uh, having problems later on uh, in life. Now, for those who are just core antibody positive, uh, you know, they could have been before surface antigen positive and over time they lose their surface antigen, right? And or they have very low level of immunity. But anyone who are just core antibody, core antibody positive, they are at risk for reactivation if they receive chemotherapy or you know some of these new drugs for treating uh, you know inflammatory bowel disease or uh, psoriasis, which suppress your immune system. So so you're still if you are. If you are core antibodies positive, uh, if you sort of are going to receive chemotherapy, make sure the oncologist monitor you for reactivation of the virus. Okay. Is there a role for vaccinating people who are only core antibody positive? No, no, because that would not uh, provide additional benefits. So CDC uh, do not recommend vaccinating anybody who are core antibody positive. Okay. 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 And then a couple of questions related. Um, I guess this this audience member says that she uh, he or she thought that she had heard that chronic Hep B can kind of resolve itself over time. How often does that happen, and uh, would an antiviral be appropriate in that case? So, so basically, what what that person mean is, uh, you know, over time the person lose the surface antigen, right? The surface antigen was positive, And then over time, it becomes uh, spontaneously uh, become negative. So that, that can happen with age. And, and some people do that. They, they, with age, they spontaneously sort of lose the uh, surface antigen and it could occur in, it depends on, you know, some people, the incidence could be as much as 1% uh, per year 
over time, you know. And but but that you know, once you lose a surface antigen, uh, it does uh, lower the risk of that person uh, developing liver cancer. But we still recommend <laughs> to to monitor those patients. You know, I have some of those patients. They and I still recommend just for uh, for safety, you know, once a year do an ultrasound, <laughs> uh, just just to make sure because it's not totally um, sort of a zero chance, even if over time you lose your surface antigen. Great. Uh, another question uh, asked about fatty liver. So if you have chronic Hep B and fatty liver, does that change the risk of uh, liver cancer? And also, what's the prevalence of having both chronic, chronic Hep B and fatty liver in the Asian community? Um, you know, I, it, it's, fatty liver is, you know, becoming more common, but it's definitely not as common in Asians, you know, it's, it's basically, you know, a problem of, um, you know, um, you know, we have too much to eat nowadays, right? <laughs> 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 and obesity. And, uh, but if you have fatty liver, if you have chronic hepatitis B, you know, and have fatty liver disease, or, you know, it's just like if you have chronic hepatitis B and you, you have alcohol sort of problem, uh, it, it, I'm sure, it, you know, I don't know the, the whether there's a da the data, but definitely, uh, theoretically, it would increase the risk of developing um, sort of a liver cirrhosis or liver, and then uh, liver cancer. Because the major driver for liver cancer is if you develop liver cirrhosis, mm -hmm. right? And but in in some uh, uh, patients uh, with chronic hepatitis B, they can actually develop liver cancer without liver cirrhosis, which is very different from hepatitis C. Hepatitis C patients who develop liver uh, cancer always have liver cirrhosis. Mm -hmm. So we have we have time for one more question. We're not going to be able to get to all the questions, but uh, this question, I think it's some, from somebody who had also emailed this question earlier who seems to, I think, know your wife uh, at MSS uh, <laughs> during school. Uh, she asks- um, Oh, it's not I, my wife, it's not my wife. <laughs> oh, oh it's, 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 I'm Betty So's MSS classmate. Uh, <laughs> is it your, rel your relative, your relative? I think it's a, yeah, I think it's a distant relative. Oh, yeah. distant relative, I see, uh, apologize. Uh, so the, the uh, she says, uh, I have a 12 millimeter cyst on my left hepatic lobe you know, why do these cysts happen? Do I have to worry about that? Is that, uh, is that a risk fast factor for anything like cancer or other diseases? Yeah, yeah. Uh, liver cysts, simple liver cysts are very common. You know, many people have uh, actually more than one, you know, there could be multiple uh, cysts, some of could be very large, but they are benign. They don't become uh, cancer. So, so just leave it alone, don't worry. Great. Well, thank you for this uh, lovely hour you've spent with us, Dr. So. It's very informative. Uh, you know, the audience is very appreciative. I've, I'm, I'm sure they've learned a lot. Um, and I want to thank the uh, Vincent V.C. Wu Foundation for sponsoring this series of talks, as well as Dr. So and the Asian Liver Center, as well as the Stanford Health Library. Uh, if you look at the chat, you can see a whole list of activities uh, for the AAP month, AAPI month, uh, which is May right now, uh, that have been sponsored by CARE. And we are going to, this will be our last talk until the fall, but we do have a Stanford Big Ideas in Medicine conference. Uh, if you go to stanfordbigideasinmedicine.org, you can get information about that conference if you're interested in hearing about the latest in medicine. So thanks for spending the evening with us. Thanks again, Dr. So. Uh, appreciate your time. Thank you, thank you. Now, now you can go back to your Warriors game. <laughs> yes, go back to the Warriors game. I don't know who's winning. <laughs> right. Okay, good night. Good night.